Welcome to our continuing series of the impact of COVID on economies worldwide, on India locally, and of course, the road ahead for many nations such as ours. Joining me to talk about what financial assets should be taken away or asset classes should be taken away from a pre-COVID era, if you may, is Robert Scharf, who's CEO at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. He's a man who's been watching waves and, and troughs in asset cycles for many, many years now. Thank you so much, Robert, for joining in. Uh, first, a snapshot really on how deep the impact you think COVID has been for financial markets generally. Well, I believe that uh, we are at the very beginning of uh, what I would consider a more fundamental uh, change in uh, markets, in financial markets, capital markets overall. And uh, I think it's very early still uh, to uh, talk about what the impact ultimately will be. What, what appears nevertheless very clearly in my mind is there will be changes. There are already some changes. We could talk about these, but uh, um, the overall impact, I think we will need uh, some time to really uh, digest and analyze what it means for the future. Mm. What are the key changes that you note almost uh, immediately or at this point? Well, in fact, there, there are a couple of things. Well, uh, as the, uh, the head of an exchange, uh, uh, first of all, the good news in this uh, um, uh, overall pandemic was, and you have seen, the massive moves in uh, asset prices at the beginning of, uh, of the pandemic in uh, basically mid-March. Uh, financial markets have responded properly in the sense of they kept on functioning. And I think, in fact, that's already a very uh, important point. Now, of course, volatility had uh, um, increased dramatically. But again, here, in fact, I find that the overall financial system has responded uh, very well. And I think, in fact, it's also one of the consequences that we learned out of the financial crisis of 2008, with all the measures, uh, both on regulation, but also on systems that have been put in place, have been working very nicely. Now, uh, looking uh, uh, back from the last weeks, in fact, I find that financial markets are extremely optimistic because basically I have seen the rebound in equity markets and uh, it looks a little bit like um, uh, the market would like to get back to normal as soon as possible, which means in fact we are still some 15 or, uh, or 20 percent in some markets down versus the very highs that we had. But also let's remember in fact the highs were the result of 10 years of continuous uh, price increases in the, in the market. So overall, I think we are quite optimistic in markets for the time being, considering that we have very little concrete indication of what it means economically for companies and for economies at large. Mm. For the Luxembourg Stock Exchange in specific, Robert, you track and look very carefully at the fixed income universe. For that specific asset class, how do you see the next few months, months really unfolding? Because as you said, it's too difficult to call longer cycles at this point. Yeah, the, uh, uh, what's interesting also to, to note, uh, the debt market has, uh, is basically booming uh, for different reasons. Uh, one, the volatility in the equity market, which push, pushes a lot of investors into uh, less riskier asset classes. But then again, I believe that, and we see this today as the key listing place for uh, international debt instruments uh, coming from all over the world. Uh, we see um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, activity from, of course, governments, supranationals, which are the first to react to uh, the pandemic and in other words, in fact, on the financing needs of the economy going forward. We see now increased activity already and we are quite early in the process of corporates who look at funding opportunities because uh, all these trillions of uh, support packages that have been decided by governments around the globe need of course to be financed. Mm -hmm. And it starts already now and um, to uh, look a little bit ahead, I think, in fact, it will uh, keep us very, very busy in uh, the debt market for uh, the months, if not, in fact, the years to come. Mm. 
the last few years have been punctuated with intense trade wars between nations, Robert. And in that sense, some of the walls were being built already. In contrast to that, financial markets have actually always been far more liquid, far more free flowing in terms of money moving between nations and between areas. Um, how do you see the debt market um, approaching China, both as a market and as an investor as well? Well, what's interesting here is um, to note that the Chinese debt market is the second biggest after uh, the U.S. Treasury market in the world. So it's an enormous market, but very little known and very little used by international investors. And um, uh, I think uh, what we see is a growing appetite for this type of instruments especially as the Chinese authorities are uh, undertaking a number of measures of progressively but very prudently opening up this market uh, and making it more easily accessible uh, to the uh, international investor. And um, maybe a good example that uh, I could uh, cite is the uh, sustainable or the green bond market. Uh, again, China's green bond market is the biggest in the world for the time being. And um, we have seen uh, increased interest from international investors of accessing that part of uh, the bond market overall. And be it only for the simple reason that uh, in this green bond market currently, the uh, um, demand is outweighing the supply very clearly. So investors are looking for alternative instruments. And here, in fact, uh, uh, in the Chinese green bond market, it has opened up. By the way, we have created with the Chinese uh, uh, exchanges what we call the green bond channel, which makes, in fact, information on Chinese domestic uh, uh, green bonds available uh, in English uh, to the uh, uh, international. So it's an uh, uh, we are building bridges, in fact, be between these markets, and I think, in fact, it's, uh, uh, we need to count on China in the future. Mm. How large do you see that side of the bond market getting, Robert, the sustainability bond market? I mean, Moody's has a $100 billion target in terms of the size of the bonds. Perhaps the green bond component will go down, but these fight COVID kind of packages are getting more and more popular amongst many of the multi, uh, you know, multinational banks. Uh, do you agree with that $100 billion figure? You think that's how big the market is for sustainability bonds? Well, in my opinion, it will be much bigger than that because we are also here, in fact, just at the beginning of a tremendous development. We're looking back at the green bond market and it's still a tiny portion of the overall uh, bond market uh, per se. But uh, uh, I must say in the current pandemic, the green uh, bond has been a little bit sidelined. Why? Because uh, the... Uh, uh, S in ESG, uh, so we were talking about the E part. Now, in fact, the social part, uh, the social dimension gains enormous importance and uh, uh, has been used by uh, uh, some of the big uh, issuers already quite uh, uh, in an important way. We have listed over the last eight weeks more than $20 billion uh, of uh, social bonds or COVID-19 related bonds and uh, we even went as far to support this initiative by uh, waiving the listing fee for uh, uh, these bonds as we feel in fact it's a contribution that we can do to make in fact this market uh, uh, evolve more quickly now uh, and we see in fact many of the financing plans of governments will aim at the social dimension of the economy so in other words in fact this type of financings will gain uh, quite substantial importance. And then when we are looking ahead, um, uh, post uh, COVID-19, whenever that will be, uh, what, what does it mean, in fact, for uh, the investment plans or these support plans to bring back economies uh, to speed? Well, uh, it means very clearly that uh, they need to be invested in a sustainable way. In other words, we need to consider in the renovation of our economic model, we need to consider the uh, environmental and the so social aspect. 
of uh, uh, these financing. So in other words, a lot of financing that will be done through the capital markets by governments, by agencies, but those who buy corporates will uh, go in fact through this part of the market because we need to rebuild a sustainable infrastructure for the future. Mm. I wanted your thoughts on how you're observing markets like India and the situation for bond markets like India. Only recently bond prices dropped sharply because the government indicated that they were almost doubling their borrowing targets and you know the question one is asking at this point is who funds that borrowing can the market absorb it how do you think markets like India will sort of navigate their, themselves in the next few months but the, uh, um, the, the, the there are two aspects in fact one is um, the bond market um, the Indian bond market and how it's being managed by locally in fact also by local investors what you are referring to and where I, I can contribute more is about the, uh, the international part and especially in fact the sustainable uh, investment part. And I think in fact the uh, uh, Indian government has also um, uh, um, worked on that path in order to promote more sustainable uh, investments and notably because also this type of bond would be snapped up in fact immediately by the international investor. The appetite is enormous and therefore this type of instrument has, I believe, in fact, performed better in the uh, current crisis. And we have seen this overall, companies with very strong ESG profile, uh, but also instruments that are being clearly identified as being ESG related have performed better in the market. So I consider this to be a very important diversification source of funding for governments and uh, helping also sustain the local uh, markets. Another large problem that we seem to be facing, Robert, and this is happening with companies worldwide, is that uh, they're losing their ratings. So hence getting changed into more risky or junk status, which also then prevents money from getting into, you know, investing in companies like these. Do you see that as a challenge going into the next few months where companies may struggle in terms of money raising? Well, it will certainly, in fact, impact uh, investors' portfolio in the first place. Uh, so there are... Um, uh, with the economic consequences that we still don't know, in fact, how far, in fact, companies will be affected uh, in certain sectors much more, in fact, than others. Um, I believe, in fact, uh, it will create, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, a separation in the market, a split in the market between those who have more easy access than others. On the other hand, you have seen this also, um, the top-rated uh, uh, government bonds are yielding still massively negatively. So in other words, investors will be looking for return, looking for yield also in that respect. So I believe in fact there, there uh, will be a market uh, for this type of companies, but uh, I think in fact we will create, uh, we will see a new composition of a universe of these companies than what we had in fact in the past. Uh, and it might also contain uh, a number of uh, good investment opportunities. So uh, I remain optimistic. One final question to you, because you've been watching uh, asset classes for so long, Robert. While they have remained functioning, there have been some crazy resets in some of them. I mean, equity markets aside, we've seen crude go down to zero. I don't think any of us imagined we'd see that in our lifetimes. And gold, which is trading at uh, some, some insane levels for itself. Uh, do you think these sort of resets do you think, first of all, resets will happen or do you think there's a whole other change that's going to come into other asset classes? Um, maybe one conclusion is that there is much too much money in the market chasing all kinds of asset classes. And, you know, uh, in uh, these uncertain times um, where there is very little guidance, um, these type of uh, asset classes, and we have seen the distortions as you refer to in the commodities market uh, overall, in quite substantial way. In my opinion, it, uh, it will not, it cannot last. Uh, uh, all will be a question of how quickly will we get economies back on track. And back on track, I do not mean necessarily to the levels where we have been, but I think what market needs is positive news, 
positive trends. And uh, I think the, uh, it will be an uphill battle. Uh, it will be a long route. But overall, um, I think uh, the traditional asset classes where you will be looking at the real value uh, for, what, uh, for, for your money will, will dominate. And I think overall, and I refer to uh, uh, the uh, uh, ESG, in fact, or the sustainability uh, question that we raised earlier on, I think overall investors will be asking much more often, uh, where is my money heading? So when I'm investing, what happens with my money? And I think, in fact, that will be an, an overwhelming um, uh, guidance in uh, capital markets going forward, which one should not uh, underestimate. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, we should be uh, try to build back better the, the three Bs, uh, and um, that's what uh, also uh, determines then where capital flows will be heading. That sounds like an extremely salutary outcome. Robert, thank you so much for this very engaging chat and your time today. Thank you. Thank you.